Uh, I will let her claim a name on it. <laughs> so uh, my talk is write the effing manual, um, which is just basically, so I uh, made an assumption that most of you would be developers, not writers. Uh, so this is for you. Sorry, writers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> tune out. Uh, it's fine. Uh, we'll be drinking soon. Uh, so my name's Jody. I'm a technical writer. Uh, I do all sorts of technical writing. Uh, so I do like UX stuff and tech journalism and that kind of thing. But I'm going to talk to you today about uh, how you can make your open source projects documentation better. You might not have the resources for a writer. You might not be able to convince them to work with you. You might have to do it yourself. So um, this is just basically how to extract your documentation from its hideous wiki with its gnarled taxonomy like 50 layers deep, like double recursive linking. You know what I'm talking about. It's terrible people, developers. Uh, so briefly cover how the consumption of documentation has changed and how that's affected uh, the way that we write documentation. And just some practical examples uh, about how you can make your document, like how you can make your writing a bit better. And then uh, just uh, some frameworks about uh, whether to use long form or short form documentation and some different ways that you can deliver documentation. So uh, then versus now. So broadly speaking, documentation used to come in the form of huge, dry, dusty printed manuals. Zach has one. It's about 19th century telegraphy. Uh, it's, uh, it's very extensive. Uh, just looking at it, drains people who aren't zacked over of the will to live. It's been used as an effective treatment for chronic insomnia. <laughs> yeah, this guy. There we go. Yes. Sure. Uh, but yeah, like these ones. And that's beautiful. I'm not here to disparage this, this style of documentation. I just think it has a time and a place and it used to be that used to be all you could that used to be all you could get. That used to be what you got. That was it. Big, heavy printed manuals, dry, complex, soporific. I'm falling asleep just talking about it. So then the internet happened, uh, and that really changed the way that we consume documentation because it introduced, uh, I guess, the democratization of information. So you have all of these new informal sources of documentation. So you have user groups and forums and, and, and mailing lists and wikis and blogs and basically everybody. There is, a, there is an absolute information overload. There is no funneling of information whatsoever. Uh, everything is everywhere. So you have, you know, I'm just going to talk about a couple of different kinds like, so the main, you know, you've got your wikis, your traditional guides, they still exist, obviously they're still uh, still lots of those around. Uh, your knowledge base style short form articles, so like the, that sort of encapsulate a discrete task. Uh, personal blogs and videos. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to argue one type of documentation exclusively. I'm not going to say this is the way you should do it. I do have a favorite. I will tell you about it. Uh, but it's just, it's just about using the format effectively. It's about being able to be discerning and choosing what kind of documentation is going to best serve your audience. So with that in mind, it's, let's just start with the, the basic structure of documentation, the three building blocks of docs. So you've got conceptual information, which is describing a new technology and how it fits into an ecosystem. It's paragraphs, it's long sentences, it's jargon and buzzwords, it's, you know, it's uh, all of that good stuff that helps you orient yourself in a, in a, new, in a new environment. Uh, then you've got procedural, step one, do this, step two, do that. Uh, so installation instructions. Uh, and then you've got your referential material, which is your appendices, they're your tables of flags and arguments, that's every possible parameter in a, an enormous list that you can search through. 
So they're like more or less all technical documentation can be filed into those categories. It kind of should be able to be filed into those categories. So for example, if you're writing API documentation, it would be heavy on the referential material because uh, you want to be able to you want to outline all of your parameters. You want people to be able to control F3 documentation and find the specific flag that they're looking for. Uh, you want it to have heaps of code samples. Um, but an inf installation guide will be almost all procedure because it's it's a task. Like installation guides are a series of tasks. So good or rounded documentation has a bit of conceptual information at the beginning, uh, a set of short procedures that describes how to accomplish a task. And then, if necessary, any follow-up referential material. So the key thing to remember is not to mix them up. So even if you do have them in the same document, keep them separate. Don't chuck concepts into your procedures. Don't include steps in your references. Keep the sections clear and not too long, because I don't know about you guys, but the internet has destroyed my attention span. I, I have the attention span of a kitten on crack. I can't. I can't, when I'm confronted with huge paragraphs of conceptual information, I just die inside and I, I write it. Like it's stuff, I, I write the stuff and then I want to die inside I, that I have to read it. So keep it short, <laughs> keep it sharp. Uh, so then, but then you're, you're like, well, what kind of information do I need to use? So, and how much, how much of each of those three should I use? And that's where you have to think about your audience. I know that a lot of this stuff has been said by writers because it's important. Uh, so if stuff's been repeated today, because you should remember it, please listen to us. Uh, so you should be thinking about your audience and it's really important to have a clear idea of exactly who this documentation is for. And I've got some bad news for you developers, it's not for you. It's not, it's not the, the feature that you work on, it's not even the product that you build, like that's, you're never gonna read your own documentation. So you have to figure out who your audience is. Is it sysadmins, is it users, is it, uh, you know, is it developers? Like who, who is your documentation for? And so especially like you have to consider their technical level. Uh, that informs how much they need to know. For example, user guides don't need dense conceptual information because they just need to have the minimum information for the user to orient themselves in clear short steps so that they're not overwhelmed with a bunch of needless information and abandon, especially like I feel like I have, I, like, I, I, I love open source, I do, and I, I feel sad about the state of open source documentation because I think that the documentation is such a strong entry point for your project that especially you use a documentation that if it's bad, then people can't install your product, they can't use it, they don't want to get involved. So you're doing yourselves a favor if you especially focus on your introductory material. Make that short, sharp, snappy. So there is a golden rule for writing sentences in technical documentation. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm making wild accusations here. And I'd say that it's maybe an unconscious notion, um, but People believe they need to sound smart when they're, when they're writing technical documentation. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. You, you need your documentation to be as dumb as possible. Uh, and by that I mean it, it needs to be really plain. Like so plain. No, 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 I'm serious. Plainer than that. Like get rid of all of your therefores and your forthwiths. Lucy brought up a good one. Thus. It needs to go, man. Sorry. Uh, thus. Ergo. No. Simple language, plain words, keep it simple. That's it, that's the golden rule for writing sentences. You're not trying to convince anybody of anything, especially not, uh, like, I already believe you're smart, you, write, you, you made this cool project, that's, I, I, I believe in your intelligence, that's fine. You're not trying to convince anybody of your product, you're not trying to make an argument for yourself, you're just trying to explain a thing and Explaining stuff is need to know only. That's it, that's the bare minimum. If you can cut stuff out of your sentences, do it, great. Go through, go home, go through some documentation that you've written recently and kill all those filler words. 
kill them all, like take them all out. It's, you know, adjectives and, and, and run on sentences, get rid of them all. And your documentation, like your document will probably shrink by a third at least, and it will be better, I promise. So I'm sorry, I, I, I know it's because, you know, especially like you've worked really hard on a feature or a project and you really want to highlight a specific thing. This is, I think, Burden was getting out with his, with his very extended jacket analogy. We don't care, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's, it's just, your documentation is fulfilling a purpose and it isn't uh, talking about your feature at length. So um, I'm just going to briefly describe uh, long form versus short form. So you're familiar with your, I mean, you're familiar with both, but you're more familiar with the long form. Kitchen sink style, large tomes, dust, dusty. Uh, obviously it's not my favorite style, uh, but there are, there, there are definitely people who want everything in one place. Uh, sometimes it's really unavoidable, like large complex environments with like extended installation instructions, uh, its configuration, you know, it just some, sometimes I understand that it doesn't make sense to break it apart and you need it all there in one place. That's okay. Sometimes you might be writing about a brand new technology and that necessitates a lot of conceptual material so that uh, you can orient the reader. It's, you know, you might be inventing stuff that hasn't existed before, so it's not described anywhere else except in your documentation. So, okay, yes, but it's like a lot of the time you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. You can make it shorter. Uh, you, can, you can use different formats to avoid that because I think that it, you're, you're carrying along the, bar the, the baggage of history of those terrible long documents that people like, if they're confronted with a PDF that's 200 pages long, they're already starting like, oh God, I don't want to, I already don't want to do this. Whereas if they've just got an article that they can scroll through a little bit and see the end of it, then it's like, oh, okay, this isn't so bad. I could, I could do this, I could, I could do this. So I'm not arguing against long form. I'm just saying use it appropriately in a narrow range of situations where you, it might be unavoidable. On the other hand, short form, especially like, you know, with the, the way that we interact with the internet now, we want answers quickly, we want short information, it really lends itself to technical documentation. So I think there's a lot of value in task oriented short form documentation. So it's, it gives you permission to be a, a, a bit less formal, you know, you don't have to, you don't feel like you have to do that dry academic style of writing because you're just, you're just writing a short article so you can sound like a person, maybe, maybe, I don't know, too far, okay. Uh, uh, it ranks really well with Google search results. Uh, if people, yeah, if people can see the end of, of the document in a couple of scrolls, uh, you know, that you avoid making them feel overwhelmed. Uh, it's especially great if you have an existing product that has a cool new feature. Uh, you can write something that looks like a tech journalism article that introduces the feature, describe something cool or useful you can do with it and then points to a larger body of documentation for further information. So I quite obviously, I, uh, I quite like short form. Uh, I am showing bias here. Uh, I also think it's the best for really specific tasks. So stuff that's too in depth to go in your main user guide, you know, like edge cases and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can think of it like help and support documentation, uh, like, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, Microsoft's documentation, <laughs> like their help documentation is actually really good uh, because it is, it's in that, <laughs> someone, someone's raised eyebrows, but it's like, they use it, they use a help documentation is good because it's in really like short consumable chunks because it's, you know, it's written for my mum. So it's like, it, it has to be, it has to be accessible to a wide range of users. But I think that that, you know, how to do one thing is uh, Red Hat. Red Hat also has excellent support documentation. Their knowledge base is really good. Uh, so, so you thought about what kind of information you're trying to convey and who exactly it's for. You've committed to writing short, clear sentences in simple language and you've decided whether it should be long form or short form. Now, which format would be the most appropriate for your readers? So we've got traditional wiki, uh, Git Jekyll combination, 
uh, and videos. That's, that's all I'm going to talk about today because attention span. Uh, so start with traditional why, why, why do you, why do you want to make a PDF? I don't understand, but okay, if you must, uh, I suppose. So uh, really big projects uh, will often require that kind of formalized documentation. Corporate clients often seek those kinds of documents for compliance purposes. So if you're courting large, like uh, financial institutions and stuff like that, they want to see PDFs with chapters in them so that they can tick a box and get certification. Uh, your conservative audience prefers it. Uh, that's, you know, it's just like, that's what they've been working with. That's what they trust. That's what they understand. Uh, it's printable if that's what you need. And sometimes that's, that might be what you need. It's like the cute example that uh, my manager was fond of using at Red Hat was that uh, RHEL had some users that were in completely closed uh, systems. And so they had to print their documentation because they had no access to the internet. So it's like, okay, sure, case studies exist. Uh, it's more labor intensive. Uh, if you must, if you want to do it this way, I would recommend using LibreOffice. Uh, LibreOffice suite is pretty great. Um, you can learn how to use the templates, please. Please use templates. If you must create documentation this way, learn how to use templates. I promise, taught myself in an afternoon. It's not as hard as it thinks. There's great resources like YouTube and stuff, like YouTube resources about it. Keeps your docs consistent uh, and you can export to PDF using, using these, these tools and it's obviously free and open source. So yeah. I'll just be over here making a frowny face at you. Why do you want to do that? I don't understand. Okay, so next, uh, wikis. So documentation writers will often hate wikis. Uh, and I will explain to you why we hate wikis. Uh, because you're like, no, but wikis are great. They're so easy. Uh, wikis are messy. It's like the concept of quick and easy to access is great. But the reality is disorderly. Making information harder to find and access risking out-of-date information mixing freely with current content and subsequently giving less cause to think clearly about a good approach to information delivery because you can just log in and type whatever and, and not think about it ever again. So that's why I, I, don't, I don't like wikis. I don't like dealing with them. Uh, but I, I understand. I understand that for a lot of open source projects, it's like this is what you've got to work with. Uh, so that's cool. You can use a wiki love of God, please implement a sensible ta taxonomy. Just, I work on a principle of being able to ask a question and find like the general region of the answer to that question in a minute or less by click through browsing. So that's like, you know, you say, okay, I want to do this task. You should be able to look at the wiki and click your way through to at least the section where you generally hope to find that information. So, Start with top level categories such as installation, administration, user and API and break the pages down as consistently as possible. I understand that there's a lot of variation in projects so it's hard to be utterly prescriptive in your categories but at least try to make them consistent. It's like Lucy was talking about standards, stand, uh, you know, standards and, and conventions can be completely arbitrary but as long as they're consistent it's cool because your user can figure out the internal logic of your wiki and they're going to know that, okay, well, if this kind of information is under this subheading over here, then that's where it's going to be over here. So please don't, don't get your, lose, your users lost in your wiki. That's, it's like, okay, if you want to organize by feature, that's fine, but you just got to make it the same. That's just pick a, pick a structure and stick to it. So my current favorite method of documentation delivery is Git Jekyll Markdown, uh, because most of your projects are probably already hosted in GitHub. You can just create a documentation uh, subdirectory. You can, it's a, it's a service that GitHub offers uh, open source projects for free. Um, they partner with Jekyll. You do some configuration. I'm not going to go into it now. And then uh, Jekyll will automatically deliver a static website of, you know, with 
design of your choosing. Uh, and it's really nice. It's really nice. Uh, it does the job. It looks okay. Uh, it's like, it's, I really like it because I, I, I really like version control documentation. I feel like that's important. So Git obviously really helps with that. Uh, Markdown is really easy to use. It's like Markdown is so easy to use. You don't, you don't have to, the barrier to entry is so low with Markdown. It's not like XML or any other markup languages. It's like probably for your needs, it'll do the job. The great, well, and also the great thing about Markdown is you can inject HTML into it if you have to do anything more complicated, you know, your complicated tables or images or want to embed video or whatever. So, I mean, it does raise the barrier to contribution a little bit, but I think that can actually be a good thing because it forces you to think more about your documentation because you're actually, it's, you know, you have to actually plan it. You have to plan it. You have to make sure that it looks okay. You have to just spend a little bit more time than you would with a wiki. So it forces you to think about it a little bit more. It's a bit like that old, uh, adage about handwriting out your notes to force you to think about them uh, before you type them up. I think it, it sort of has the same effect. Uh, so I'll talk very briefly about videos uh, because they're like a pretty tricky format. Uh, I don't know, like, I don't know if you guys have the time to make videos. Uh, not everybody likes them. They're really labor intensive, but they can be really valuable, especially if you've got a really complex UI or, you know, you're trying to you're trying to engage users um, with stuff that's really unfamiliar. So it's sort of, you know, at the very least, you can, you can walk them through it. And uh, I, was, I was fairly anti-video until I sat down and watched a bunch of videos about how to make templates uh, in, in, you know, in LibreOffice and, and that sort of thing. And it, was, it actually really helped. So I'm converted. But uh, I guess, so less of you are Australians than I thought there would be, but... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I will still make, crack this joke, like, uh, seriously, Australians, if you're going to voice over your own, uh, videos, write a script, talk slowly, do you think that it's not Australian slang? It totally is. Nobody else understands you. Uh, so, <laughs> it's... Uh, if you, if you, I guess that, that also applies to, to, um, other, other speakers as well. It's, you know, speak slower than you think you are, no slower and, and make sure that you've prepared a script and you're not just clicking through your UI and, and mumbling stuff as you go. So just make sure that you, again, keep it simple, keep it task oriented, keep it short, uh, on that note, questions, discussion. Yes, no. Um, heaps of projects. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chuck up a link. Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, are there any specific examples of, of how the, uh, the GitHub Jekyll relationship works? Actually, so, uh, funnily enough, the GitHub Jekyll documentation is actually pretty great. Uh, so you can, Check it out uh, on on GitHub, and they have some really good examples um, of how it works. It was I was dumped into it. Uh, just go make documentation suite. So I just I figured it all out. So I'd say that that's a fairly low technical barrier. <laughs> Integrate, oh, sorry, it integrates quite easily with Travis as well. So if you want to set up uh, sort of the full documentation stack from continuous integration version control, um, it is it is super easy and the docs uh, will walk you straight through that process. That is actually very true. And then, you know, you can actually test your documentation. And, and incidentally, Beautiful. if that works best with Markdown, um, but if you want to use some other sort of language, say restructured text or something. You can also use it, you just cut out the um, Jekyll part, um, but you can still, as long as you build static files, yep. uh, st static HTML files, you can still publish to a GitHub page and you could still use Travis to do it. Yeah, but it won't be as pretty. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying like if people are, for some reason, have a whole bunch of documentation and some other, some other kind of markup that- Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So it is flexible as well. Um, yeah. it's, it's actually 
pretty pretty handy. Uh, and you Team can do GitHub. and you can do neat tricks with it as well. The one problem that sorry, I'm going on a bit because we've just been experiencing some pain points with this. One problem we have had with it, <coughs> excuse me is that even if you have a private repository on GitHub, if it's just github.com, um, the GitHub page is still not private. Um, so all GitHub pages from github.com are public. Um, even if the source is sitting in a private repo, which is maybe a bit of a gotcha. If you want internal documentation, you have to work around that some other way. For instance, if you have an internal private GitHub at yourdomain.com instance, you can do it that way. Mm. Um, but you know, in the open source world, it's totally awesome because you don't have, you don't have to have internal stuff. Yeah, because it's supposed to be out there. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. It's like if you if you if you've got your your yeah. little open source project, then you're putting it all out there anyway. So, but it's uh, that the the documentation itself around that process is really good. So I do yeah. recommend it. Recommend. Yeah. Thanks, Great. Brian. Anybody else? Uh, thanks, Jody. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to a nice piece of research that came out in December last year on um, using long words. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's from Princeton University, and the paper is entitled Consequences of Erudite Vernacular Utilised Irrespective of Necessity. <laughs> I like it already. Subtitled The Problems with Using Long Words Needlessly. Yes. And they found that using the big words actually made the speaker or the, the writer seem less intelligent. Oh, that's really interesting. So it, and it's quite clear research. It's quite definitive. I, I totally, I totally agree it's because words. It's the simple it words. It makes people. It makes people really mad. It makes people really mad when you, you know, when it makes it harder. It makes it harder to read your documentation. That's it's all of this, all of it, all of your goals, your documentation goals should be about making it easier to read. That's that's it. So it's, uh, yeah. Don't don't. Don't, it's okay, you don't have to use them. You can show your amazing intelligence in the beauty and elegance of your code. Anybody else? Everybody wanna go home? One question. Oh yeah, sure. Um, is there an online resource for how to write for say a specific audience? So if you're writing, if you contracted to write for sysadmins, like surely like a lot of sysadmins know that certain amount so rather than having to all the time find out what they expect to know and that kind of thing or? I actually can't think of any off the top of my head I think that uh, opensource.com is looking to sort of provide that kind of resource I know that they've got a lot of good stuff in their documentation column uh, there's it's sort of it is hard. There's like there's a, there's a there's a lack of resources about how to write for specific audiences. It's I find it's mostly uh, it's very marketing oriented. You know, when they talk about content is king, and you find a lot of stuff about how to produce content, but it's all very marketing related, and it's not it's not about how to be a good technical writer. Uh, keep an eye on the work of this man over here, who no doubt will produce some really excellent uh, documentation about how to be a better writer one day. Yes, I'm talking about you. This is yeah, like. I've like, got several writing books uh, that have been taken to the manuscript format right now. It seems to me, and this is just my experience, uh, the, the question was how do I learn to write for a hidden audience? For instance, Sysadmin was supposed to use, as we have heard several times today, this Sysadmin is not like that. I, I find the best way to discover what your audience wants is to write the wrong thing and they'll let you know. Yeah, because you're talking to that person. Because the first interaction you're having with somebody, yeah. they might be like, oh, that person's stupid. I'm done talking to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't, I don't personally like that method, but. But it does work. It will provoke developers into spoofing. That is, yes. It's a last resort, but it is an effective one. I'm a dev, so, and I've changed, you know, I've changed Hello. Um, <laughs> hello, ladies. <laughs> hello, ladies. Um, sorry. That was thanks to Alex. Uh, anyway. um, sorry. So I am a dev, and I totally agree. I've changed jobs, always a dev, um, and every time I start a new job, there are different industries, not necessarily industries, different companies use different buzzwords. 
And so you just can't assume that one sysadmin or one developer would understand what you're talking about because it's kind of culturally different, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, uh, it's like, I mean, writing uh, should, especially open source writing, should be an iterative process. Uh, so you should really try to make it as good as you can. You've got to make assumptions, do as much research as you, as you think you can, uh, put it out there, get the feedback, get it incorporated quickly. People will appreciate the effort. That's, I, think, I think that is a, a big problem with open source projects as well is that Feedback, especially on documentation, feels like it's falling into a black hole. So it's just, uh, you know, if you can, if you can be a bit better about that. Yes, Brian. Oh, sorry, Zach. Well, I have the microphone, but I'll give it to Brian. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is... okay, okay. Well, I just have one thing to say about how you know when your documentation, or like, is your documentation good? Uh, when I work on a particular thing, like I, I come to it totally ignorant. I, I work on stuff that's developing. Like it's all container related stuff and it's stuff that like didn't exist last week and now it does. So the first thing you have to find out is what does it even do? And you end up talking to developers all the time and then you, you end up becoming as familiar with uh, the situation that provoked the existence of the application into existence. Uh, you become about as familiar with it as they are which is a terrible position from which to assess whether your documentation is accurate or not. In the past year, I had to write a procedure explaining how to do a thing, and then there was like four months when I was not working on that, and then I had to work on it again. And only then could I assess whether the procedure that I myself had written was effective. It was, by the way, it was great, it was fantastic. <laughs> uh, but I had no idea until then, because after I'd worked on it every day, even if there wasn't something in the procedure, I would still know because I'd been, you know, like, oh, well, I have to add this in here. Fortunately, but then it's staled. And these are the terms that I use for it. It's staled. And then I could look at it with fresh eyes and with ignorance. Ignorance is a huge, uh, it, it, it sounds ridiculous to say, but ignorance as a technical writer is a fantastic resource because otherwise you'll have no idea if the documentation is giving the ignorant reader what they need. And presumably, your audience is ignorant, otherwise they wouldn't have started reading. So, sorry, I know that's long-winded, but you guys now know that I'm long-winded. <laughs> uh, Brian? Oh, so, following on from not Zach, but the previous question. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Zach. Uh, so, I, I guess then my question is, um, having kind of gone through this pain recently yourself, mm. what, uh, how, how do you close the feedback loop? What tools are you using and, and sort of how are you making sure that people don't feel like documentation bugs and requests are falling into a black hole? Um, so I'm the only writer in my company uh, and so that makes it a bit easier but I, I did, when I did work at Red Hat, it was a thing that I cared about a lot and it is honestly, I'm really sorry but it's talking to people. It's it's actually getting to know the people that you're working with so that you can have both formal conversations about documentation and informal conversations uh, that sort of fill in those gaps. It, it really is about having, you know, just as a writer, sometimes you just have to really push it. You just have to make yourself be a part of it. You just have to, you have to, make yourself a priority you have to sh you have to you have to talk until they answer you just so that you'll shut up that's <laughs> my approach my personal approach uh to life or to mileage. docs <laughs> <laughs> your mileage may vary uh i wish you the best of luck anybody else are we good can i start drinking now is that okay <laughs> Start. Yeah. Yes. All good? Okay, cool. Thanks, everybody.